All right, for the last time, if the Arab world was a family, you know, you have the movie star Arabs, you have the GCC country club, team Afro Arab, the amazing Amazigh, everyone loves Oman, she's like the happy grandma that feeds you, nobody understands what Morocco is saying, and then you get to Yemen, who is, well, they don't quite fit into any of these groups, because technically without them, all other Arabs wouldn't even exist. Welcome to our last and final Arab country, Yemen. <laughs> It's time to learn geography now! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Get your Geography Now merch like this Geography Now t-shirt or this Geography Now mug at geographynow.com. Not selling out if it's your brand. And you can get mini barbs at figgyme.com. I am now in figurine form. Just a heads up, mini barbs is not a shelf figurine. It's a travel buddy. You're supposed to take this guy with you and take videos and pictures of him all over the world. Where would you like to take mini barbs? Get one now and take a picture and I'll post it on social media. I'm gonna put him in his home, in the mug, and put the mug away. Okay, you know, I cannot think of a better way to end our last last Arab country than with the country where Arabs all started. We're finishing right back to the beginning. Okay, so yes, Yemen has made quite a few recent global headlines, but very few people take the time to actually dive in and look at the insanely rich yet often perplexing multi-layered nation with history that goes back about 7,000 years. And a lot has happened in those 7,000 years in terms of sovereignty. Let's look at the map now, shall we? <laughs> Now, this is gonna get a little complicated. So complicated that we will actually have to break the motion graphic into two parts. So first off, part one, the basics. First of all, Yemen is located on the southwestern part of the Arabian Peninsula, bordering Oman and Saudi Arabia, with coasts and islands on both the Red Sea and the Bab el-Mandab Strait, and the Gulf of Aden, which follows the Horn of Africa and connects into the Indian Ocean. The largest island and probably most famous one being Socotra, which is technically considered geographically part of Africa, which would make Yemen a bicontinental nation. Now, this is where things get complicated. On paper, the country's constitutional capital is Sana'a, located in the northwest part of the country, divided into 21 governors and one municipality, Amnat al-Asima, which is basically just Sana'a's metropolitan area, not part of any governorate, despite the fact that it is surrounded by the Sana'a governorate and also acts as its capital, but it is still a separate entity as well. Get it? No? Okay, well, don't question it, just move on. After Sana'a, the second and third largest cities are Taiz and Al-Hudaida. The country's largest airport is Sana'a International, which used to carry about 80% of domestic and 87% of international flights to the country. However, as of the onset of the Houthi uprising of 2014, the airport has taken considerable damage and didn't reopen for commercial flights until May of 2022 with a single flight service to Jordan. Today, most of the international flights have been rerouted to Aden, the fourth largest city on the southern coast, and also has the largest shipping port and is where the internationally recognized government of Yemen has been relocated. The country has no rail lines and the only other means of transport on land are the extensive road networks that reach all parts of the country. However, you'll notice most of them are in the northwestern parts of the country, where somewhere around 88% of the population lives. However, again, since the Houthi uprising, many of these roads are blocked locked off and have been so since conflict times. So number one, Sana'a is also known as Sam City, as it is traditionally believed that Sam, or Shem, the son of Noah from the Bible and the Quran, was the founder of the city after the Great Flood. Two, Aden was the only real British colony in the Arabian world, believe it or not. Wait, didn't the British and French colonize a lot in this area after the fall of the Ottoman Empire? Eh, technically they had a role of authoritative presence, but many people here will remind you that those were protectorates and mandates, not colonies. There's a slight difference. What is the difference? <laughs> I will protect you as long as we come to certain agreements in regards to the role I play in your foreign policy and services. And you still get somewhat of a degree of self-sovereignty. You are a seized land from a former empire that I am set to administer with the intent to inevitably grant independence when the time is right. Oh, you are straight up mine. There you go. And he hua. Okay, so now you're probably a little confused. Okay, well, what's going on? Okay, parts of the country are closed off. Who's the uprising 2014? And Aiden is considered kind of like a, is it considered a new capital by what, what, what's going on? Well, you have to understand something. For most of Yemen's history, it was never even unified like the way it was in today's map. The closest thing the country of Yemen today had to a historical unified moment would probably maybe be the Himyarite kingdom in like 100 BC. Historically, Yemen 
Yemen, much like the rest of the Arabian world, was split up between multiple, multiple clans and tribal societies. Long story short, throughout much of their history, there's always been kind of more or less of a north-southern division, even before colonialism. And if you are like me and have a very short attention span that requires visuals to learn things, you're in luck! Motion graphic number two, here you go explaining. So first off, these six governorates have generally had closer ties, whereas the remaining smaller 15 in the northwest have usually had their own things going on. Let's take it back to the most recent contemporary period. All of Yemen used to be under the Ottoman Empire, and after the fall, the north part was under the Mutawakalite Kingdom, whereas the south part fell into British protectorate and colonial status. In 1962, the north part of Yemen deposes their monarchy and becomes a republic, whereas the south gains independence and adopts communism. Either way, both became the first and only republics in the Arabian Peninsula. Finally, in 1990, after nearly an entire century of being completely separated and with distinct separate political ideologies, they decide to unify into one Yemen. This only lasted one year, and drama started with the assassination of political opponents, which led to a civil war, which led to even more tension. Fast forward to 2011, the Arab Spring happened, Yemen joined in, and once again starts getting politically heated. In 2013, a UN-sponsored national dialogue proposed that the country split up into six federal regions, which was rejected by the North and South separatists. In 2014, the majority Shia Zaidi peoples formed the Houthi group, fights against the central government, and creates the Houthi Revolutionary Committee, replacing the internationally recognized government of Yemen, causing said government to relocate to the south in Aden. Then in 2015, a third faction, the Southern Transitional Government, kind of broke off from the central government, while Tariq Saleh, nephew of the former president, led his own thing that took over much of the west coast. But then in 2020, all three kind of merged again, creating the Presidential Leadership Council, which today is the new internationally recognized government of Yemen. So there you go. Yeah, it's so confusing. Even today, many Yemeni people don't even know exactly what's going on and who exactly is in charge of what. They just want to like live their lives, work, sleep, and maybe chill at home, choose some got, and that's it. We're going to get to the got thing later. And get this, it's especially complicated because right at the Bab el Mandab Strait lies a ton of the world's internet cables connecting three continents, and on top of that, a huge portion of the Red Sea trading routes, and North Yemen has been known to attack vessels that they deem as enemy ships that get within their waters, which is why in 2018, the UN brokered a ceasefire deal on the port of Hudaida, North Yemen's largest shipping port. So that's what the situation is like as of now in 2024. Of course, things are subject to change within time, and this video's information could be outdated, but the point is, geopolitically speaking, Yemen is in quite the complicated scenario right now. Nonetheless, despite all these complications, Yemen is still a land that boasts tons of incredibly world-renowned sites. No conflict can destroy their heritage. And with that, I had to have one of our Yemeni jogger peeps to explain. Take it away! Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ma'akum akhulkum, Muhammad al-Jahmi. Hey everyone, I'm Muhammad al-Jami, and I'm going to tell you about famous places in Yemen. Now, of course, as Barb's already explained, there's currently a complicated situation going on between the north and south sides of Yemen. So you might need proper paperwork to see these places. If you are a foreigner, just keep that in mind. First, you have to understand Yemen is a historical country. Everything here is rooted in culture that dates back not hundreds, yet thousands of years. Today, Yemen does have five UNESCO World Heritage Sites. It should have more, to be honest. Uh, the first one being the historic town of Zabit, which has beautiful carved brick buildings and mosques. It was well known for its Islamic university and and it was the former capital of Yemen. The landmarks of the ancient kingdom of Seba and Marib, which date back to 1000 BC. This was a home of Queen Sheba, or in Arabic we say Bilqis. Now moving on to the old city of Sana'a, which is the modern capital of Yemen, with its decorated medieval buildings. When you really Google the picture of Sana'a, you would almost not believe that these buildings were made without excavators and cranes. Shabam, I'm sure everyone has heard of this city. Its nickname is the Manhattan of the desert. Again, this is something you should be in awe of when you search up Google Images. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they built this without modern technology. And of course, probably Yemen's most famous natural site is the Sukhatra Archipelago, which has some of the most unique plant species on earth. Uh, but honestly, the best thing to see in Yemen is the daily life of the people, go to the markets, explore the narrow alleys in Babel, Yemen, which is the door of Yemen, enjoy sitting on the rooftop, enjoy coffee. Yemen will not disappoint you. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Check out Yemen. I love you, Barbs. Thank you. It's amazing what ancient human innovation was capable of creating with their natural resources. And speaking of natural resources, let's take it to the next segment. The...
Now, when most people think of the Arabian Peninsula, they just think sand. But oh, if only they knew what else there was and how much of Yemen has to offer. Let's jump into the motion graphic to explain, shall we? First of all, if you look at Yemen from above, you'll notice two things. Much of it is made up of dry, arid lands. And two, it's almost as if the entire country has a mountain ridge that creates a perfect right angle following the edges of the country. This right angle is formed by the Sarwat, Hadramat, and Al Mara mountain ranges. And the tallest peak of the country, Jabal al Nabi Shu'a, can be found in the Sarwat range, not far from the capital Sana'a. These ridges slope down into flat coastal areas along the sea, the Hadramat coast on the southeast, and the Tehama on the Red Sea. Within the Sarwat, you can also find the largest inland body of water, the Marib Reservoir, created by the Marib Dam. And although most rivers in Yemen are wadis, or seasonal rivers that dry up in the summer months, they do have a few permanent rivers, the longest one being the Masila River, which is usually full year-round and empties into the Gulf of Aden. From there, the rest of the country is made up of air arid, mostly uninhabited desert zones, aka the Ramiat As Sabatain and Rubal Khali deserts, or the Empty Quarter. Important to note that some of Yemen's islands are volcanic, such as Jabal al Tair, which had an eruption in 2007. And also keep in mind, the Socotra Archipelago, made up of four main islands, is connected to the Horn of Africa via the Somali Plate, only separated by the Garafui Channel. It is not volcanic, but has some of the most isolated and unique endemic species we will discuss about later in this episode. So stay tuned! Yeah, I know, we'll get to the Socotra Island thing, I know you're all waiting for it, it's going to be in Caleb's segment. Just wait, okay? Stay tuned. In any case, Yemen isn't just dry desert. If you look around, there's actually lots of lush greenery and terraced farmlands, and yes, even the waterfalls. If you reach far enough, you'll see the wonders. And speaking of reaching, uh, this is usually the part where I reach for my triple shot espresso break. However, Noah was uh, not available for this. He was too busy. So uh, I will just fill in for Noah's segment. I'm sorry, Noah. My, my co-hosts have lives, guys. They have stuff to do, okay? All right, so anyway, due to a number of factors that have destabilized their current state of affairs, Yemen is today the lowest ranked GDP country in the Arabian Peninsula with the lowest average income and one of the lowest in the Middle East in general. But see, the thing is, they have everything they need to move forward, it's just the complicated, ever so shifting system of multiple bureaucracies at once that messes everything up for them. For example, they have quite a few oil fields, such as the Marib and Masila blocks, which are able to produce enough for domestic and export demands. The problem is the larger Marib field lies right on the border of the conflict lines and many pipelines go in and out of the area. One goes to the port of Ras Isa, the other to Bir Ali and Balhaf. So you can imagine how this might complicate things economically when you have a domestic standoff. And here's the thing, everything just kind of went south only like three months after the unification. It was like, Hey, congrats on unifying Yemen. You're finally one country. Oh, hey, you hear about that war going on? Iraq is trying to invade Kuwait, but we're totally backing up Kuwait. Right? We're backing up Kuwait, right? Right? Many will say that that was probably the moment everything kind of slipped up for them. Shortly after, Saudi Arabia expelled over 1 million Yemeni workers from their country, and they, along with other Arab nations, cut off huge aid programs that they were dependent on. Add on top of that, some more drought, internal conflict, and bam, you have quite an unfavorable situation. Nonetheless, everyday Yemenis in all parts of the country have learned how to kind of hold their ground amidst the chaos that they never asked for. Agriculture and fishing are still important industries, making up the second largest exports after petroleum. And of the agriculture, you kind of have to understand Yemenis are kind of obsessed with Qat. What is Qat? Actually, it's sometimes also spelled the Q in an Arabic, you know, the Q makes the Qat sound like. We did this in the Qatar episode. Anyway, Qat is a plant where the leaves are chewed and used as a mild recreational stimulant. It is popular in East Africa and Yemen, and according to Yemeni Jagrapip Saleh, pretty much 90% of the people here use it. Qat is so popular that some people complain that there is too much of it growing and it's taking up the water supplies when the water could be used to grow other cash crops like coffee or grains. And let me tell you something about coffee. Yes, coffee originated in Ethiopia, but Yemen was the first place documented to have truly cultivated and produced it in their highlands. In fact, that's even how the word Arabica got its name. It was cultivated in Arabia, and much of it was transported through the port of Mocha, which is where the word Mocha comes from. From there, it became a global phenomenon. And another phenomenon in Yemen, the amazing flora and fauna that can be found here. With that, let's move on to the animal segment with our animal correspondent, Caleb. 
All right, what country are we doing today? Oh, that was a throwback. I'm not allowed to do that voice anymore. So let's just get to the most unique natural site everyone discusses about when it comes to Yemen, Socotra Island. This place is so renowned that even during conflict years, they still have a noticeable degree of tourism. Socotra is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and due to its intense isolation, the islands have been able to harbor some of the most fascinating endemic species of plants on Earth, labeling it the jewel of biodiversity in the Arabian Sea and the most alien looking place on earth. Most of the trees and shrubs are adapted to the dry arid limestone karst topography of the island and hence have fat heavy trunks and skinny branches. I personally think they almost look like upside down monster squids much like Paul's hair and octopi reaching out from the ground. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, that's just Socotra Island. The mainland has lots of animals as well. Over 460 bird species have been spotted, and there are tons of mammals too. Hamadrias baboons, sand cats, striped hyenas, mountain gazelles, and the critically endangered Arabian leopard. Only about 70 known left in the wild. Thankfully, there is a captive breeding program at the Taiz Zoo that aims to help repopulate the species and re-release them back to the wild when the timing is right. Of course, Yemen's terrain is the perfect habitat for reptiles as well, like the Arabian cobra, horned viper, puff adder, and of course, African helmeted turtles. And other sea turtles can be found on many of their beaches. All right, there's your Yemen animal overview, and I'm over with viewing the teleprompter for my segment. Cheers, guys. Ooh, good throwback again. Throwback. But you're still Threw not it right back. But you're still not allowed. <laughs> Oh, my knee! Oh, you're wearing <laughs> flip-flops with socks. Show this, I gotta show this. <laughs> One of those days. Thank you, Caleb. One more interesting side note. Due to their accommodating terrain, Yemen is the country that produces the most tropical fruits out of any country in the Arabian Peninsula. It is also said that the fruits somehow find their way into the various dishes that make up the unique and various dishes found in Yemeni cuisine. To talk more about the food of Yemen, here is another one of our Yemeni geography peeps. Take it away. Hey, everyone. I'm Ahmed. Food in Yemen is very delicious. For one, you have to understand that there are many regional cuisines within Yemen, but commonly it is likely that you will be served in a communal setting with big platters that multiple people share from, and lunch is the biggest meal of the day. You will notice lots of beef, chicken, and lamb meat. Those are our favorite meats. Along the coast, of course, there will be more seafood dishes. For breakfast, we usually keep it light, maybe just a few dates or some eggs with flatbread with some coffee. Yemenis love their coffee. We also love tea. We even have a special milk tea called Adani that we specialize in. Then when lunch comes, we go crazy. We love our meat stews and rice, stuff like fahsa, harissa, hanif, kebsa, mendi, samak mova, shifut, and zorbian. But our national dish is probably selta, which is a stew made with, with meat, eggs, fungi greek, chilies, potatoes, tomatoes, garlic, and other vegetables, and sometimes even rice. Yemenis typically grow and consume more tropical fruits like mangoes and papayas in their diets than their Arab neighbors, which are grown in Al Hudayda in Western Yemen. And we typically cook spicier than our other Arab neighbors. For dessert, there is Yemeni honey cake or bintu sah or masoub, or just try some of our amazing fresh fruits. Due to the war, a lot of the Yemenis left the country and opened cafes and restaurants pretty much in every major city in the world. So I highly encourage you to go and visit your local Yemeni restaurant. Then come back to this video and tell us how awesome your meal was. You're welcome. Thank you! Man, I love Yemeni food. The first time I actually tried it was in Ethiopia, oddly enough. And it's, it's crazy because Ethiopia has like a huge historical connection to Yemen. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's find out more in the next segment, The Demographics. So let's get to the main point. Yemen has a lot of ancient history. Now, according to tradition, Arabs say that Ishmael, the first son of Abraham in the Bible and Quran, married a woman of the Jurhum tribe, and eventually through them, the Qatanite Arabs, or the first original Arabs, were born, whom were in Yemen. Although some say it wasn't Ishmael, some say it was Jokshan, his half-brother, but who knows, Middle Eastern lineage stories, they get so complicated. On top of that, Yemen is supposedly the home to the kingdom of Sheba, or Seba, which may also have included parts of what are now Eastern Africa, 
Africa, which is why Ethiopians today claim the Queen of Sheba in the Bible. And they say that she had a child with King Solomon, whose name was Menelik, the first emperor of Ethiopia. Seriously, it's like everybody wants to claim some kind of origin peace story from Yemen. It's like Yemen is like the source country. It's crazy. Well, with that, let's go to the demographics graph and see how the people of modern Yemen break down demographically, shall we? First of all, the country has about 34 million people and has more tribes and clan groups than any other Arab country at somewhere around 200 to 400, depending on how you classify a tribe versus clan. Now, this is where statistics get a little complicated because Yemen doesn't really take ethnicity into account in their census. Everybody is just kind of considered Arab, but they rather more or less go by tribal clan affiliations, which some studies estimate make up about 85% of the country's population. Some of these tribes include the largest and most predominant ones, the Hashid, Bakil, Zaidi, Mazhaj, Kinda, Himyar, and Hadramat tribes. From there, it's difficult to get exact estimates and lines get really blurry, but somewhere maybe around 10% are considered to be mixed tribal Yemeni Arabs or other Arab groups from outside Yemen, whereas the remaining 5% or maybe upwards to 10% are Afro-Arabs, mostly from East African countries like Djibouti, Somalia, and so on, with a small minority of Asians, mostly from Muslim nations like India, Pakistan, and Indonesia. For plug outlets, they use an interesting fusion of the types A, D, and G outlets. They drive on the right side of the road. As for currency, they use the Yemeni Rial. However, it's complicated because the north side does not accept the newly printed bills issued by the south side printing facilities in Aden, as they accuse it as economic vandalism. So this effectively creates two technical separate currencies with separate exchange rates. And back to the driving thing, driving laws in Yemen are very relaxed. Geography Saleh says seatbelt laws are rarely enforced. In fact, you might even get stopped for wearing a seatbelt because police might assume that you are hiding something. And it's not uncommon to see like little children driving cars and trucks and buses. Oh, I've seen that a few times in some of my travels. So as an Arab country, Yemen obviously speaks Arabic as their official language. However, they do have their own distinct Yemeni dialects. Also keep in mind, the Arabic language actually pretty much evolved out of Yemen, but it wasn't just Arabic. Today, Yemen still has communities that speak ancient cousin Semitic languages that are unique and only found here, such as Mehri, Razihi. And because they were so isolated, everyone on Sakatra Island speaks Sokotri. In fact, there were even proto-Semitic scripts that were used as early as 2000 BC during the Sabian Kingdom years. They were called the Musnad and Zabur scripts. You can see them in Yemeni museums. And back to the Ethiopia thing again, these scripts are essentially what inspired the Giz script that is used in Ethiopian Eritrea today, writing the languages like Amhara, Tigray, and so on. Some speculate that it may have even inspired the Armenian script, who knows? And on top of that, the Hadramat sailors were the ones that pretty much set off to migrate and spread Islam to places like West India and Southeast Asia. Everything, Everything connects, connects back, back to Yemen? Yemen? Everything connects back to Yemen. It's crazy. Okay, now let's move on. Faith-wise, religion. The absolute majority of the country is Muslim. From my research, it came out to somewhere around 60 to 65 Sunni, 35, 40% Shia, but it's hard to guess exact numbers because each side kind of claims that they have a little more of what the statistics claim. As mentioned, the Houthi group in the north are Shia, made up predominantly of the Zaidi peoples, and a very small community of about 1% of the country are considered non-Muslims. One extra side note, many of you guys also wanted me to mention that prior to 1950, before most of them moved to Israel, Yemen was also home to a huge ancient Jewish population dating back to the first century BC. They were known as the Temanim Jews of the Mizrahi branch. They are considered some of the most traditional and ancient Jews that have preserved the Hebrew language best. Okay, now with all of the basics out of the way, let's move on to some more dynamic aspects of Yemeni culture and peoples. And there is nothing more dynamic than sports. So with that, let's move on to art with the sports part. What up, guys? It's me. I'm back. I missed the last episode, but me and Tartan are happy to be back. Say hi, buddy. So what do you do in the stadiums of Yemen? You say, yeah, man, it's Yemen. <laughs> yeah, so it took almost the entire episode to slip in that pun. In any case, when it comes to athletics, let's just be honest. Making international headlines for their sports prowess isn't exactly the country's number one priority right now. You know, if you know what's going on over there. Nonetheless, that doesn't mean that they don't like sports. And of course, they still have activities that they do. The most traditional sport they perform and are known for would be camel jumping. You get to hop from hump to hump on a camel. 
Oh my god, okay. You get, you get one per episode. So keep in mind, the tradition is only found on the West Coast and is unique to the Zaranik tribe. So it's like the unique Zaranik. They usually wear uh, blue and perform the act at weddings and festivals. Why do they do it? Because they can. You can, if you want to jump over a camel, you can. If you have a camel, you jump over it. Otherwise, you might encounter some other traditional sports like the cool Al-Tatib, stick fighting martial art. Uh, it or originated in Egypt, actually, though. Like other countries, they play kabaddi, which is like a tag type of game. You know, you're it. Like most of the world, soccer or football is the most popular sport, and their most popular player probably being Ali Al Nono, as opposed to Ali Al Yes Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the national team unfortunately isn't exactly ranked high on FIFA's roster, currently ranked number 156, but they do have potentially promising U15s, U16s national teams. Yemen even won both of the 2021 and 2023 West Asian Football Federation Junior Championships. When it comes to other sports though, most Yemenis will tell you about Nassim Hamed, aka Prince Nassim, the most popular boxer in all of Yemen. He competed for 10 years between between 1992 and 2002. And in 2015, he was inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame. Give that man a trophy. Oh wait, they kind of already did because he kind of won stuff. So he has probably a lot of trophies in his attic. Uh, in any case, that's the sports part. Uh, I gotta go now and eat a bucket of lard because I have given up and I pretty much have no standards for my diet anymore. And Neither does Tarchin, so we're gonna go eat ourselves to death and um, probably won't make it through to the next episode. So, cheers guys. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Art. Oh, and speaking of art, there is so much to discuss when it comes to the cool things your many people have created and are known for in terms of the art world. But to explain more on the culture and stuff like that, here's Random Hannah with Culture Stuff one more time. Let's take it away, Hannah. Hi guys, I'm back. And if you forgot, I am a mom. I have a baby. So that's why she's busy these days and has a life. So to understand Yemen, you have to first understand the social structure that a lot of the people adhere to. I'm talking about tribal structure. In Yemen, tribal structure usually goes down from tribal union to tribe to clan to house. And most Yemenese can trace their lineage back to all of these categories down to multiple generations. In such, Yemen's culture is extremely diverse depending on which region you're in. For example, in the northern areas, many of the people may be considered more conservative and Shia derived and thus their culture relies more on poetry and songs. Women are more likely to wear the niqab in public areas. In the southern areas, dress codes are a little more relaxed. However, both sides have a wide variety of colorful pattern jalabia or balto dresses. These dresses are usually accessorized with akik or agate stone jewelry as is commonly mined in Yemen. As for men, unlike other Gulf nations, men in Yemen are more inclined to wear turban headgear and futas or Arab kilts. I want everyone to know that I don't read the scripts beforehand and look, it's here on this cute little teleprompter. It's all cold reading and Hannah is, she's done this for years, she knows how to do it. I'm a pro. <laughs> and while sitting, you will notice many of them use hablas or sitting belts a lot. These are used for back support so they can comfortably sit in areas without something to lean against. Marriages are almost always arranged by family and the practice of bride price or dowry is very common. The groom's family is expected to cover all costs of the wedding ceremony. I think that's awesome. <laughs> Cause I, my family paid for my wedding. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> another thing, weapon culture. It is not at all uncommon to see men carrying either a jabia or curved dagger or just a gun. Guns are actually considered a right, not a privilege in Yemen, and are therefore allowed without a permit or license. It is speculated that almost every family has at least one or two. Now they got that in common with Alabama. I mean, everybody in Alabama's <laughs> got a gun. I knew you were going to add the Alabama thing. I mean, it's just true. It's just true. Just... In the realm of poetry, Yemen's most popular poet is Abdullah al Baraduni, and his work were reflects the years of conflict and instability in his haunting pieces. And in the realm of art, one thing Yemen is known for, takrim, or stained glass, made in geometric patterns with red, blue, green, and yellow. Many houses and buildings have it, and the art form has spread to the rest of the Arab world since then. But the most noticeable and iconic form of Yemen's art scene would have to be their traditional architecture. As mentioned, Yemen was home to some of the oldest high-rise tower buildings in the world. Due to the terrain, they had to adapt their buildings to the rock
rocky outcroppings and cliff sides while using traditional mud and stone masonry techniques and exterior carved plaster designs to create these marvels of Arabian craftsmanship. Not only that, but the insides of the building had an ingenious design of low-leveled window sills and ventilation was acquired through cooling boxes called shoeback, which were positioned within the walls. And within these walls were multi-purpose rooms. Oftentimes, one would even be reserved for entertaining guests and sometimes with music. And with that, oh, the teleprompter is telling me that Keith, our usual music guy, is busy. He's leading music tours in Florida. Nah. <laughs> to talk more about the music of Yemen, here's one of our geography peeps to explain. Yemen is rich in musical heritage and is well known through the Arab world for its distinct sounds. In fact, UNESCO designated the Al Ghina Al Sanaani poetic songs as an intangible cultural world heritage of humanity. Yemen even has a national song day on July 1st. Now, there are many regional music styles, but the two most famous ones are probably Sanaani style and Hadami style. The Sanaani or Sanaa music style specializes in using a song poetry called Khomeini, accompanied by the tunes of Rood or Qumbus. Hadrami music, on the other hand, is usually considered the more influential style that has inspired a lot of other music styles, not only across the Arab world, but even as far as East Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. The most famous singer probably being Abu Bakr Salem, as well as others like Arwa and Bilqis, Ahmed Fathi, and Jewish Yemeni artists like Arfa Hazza. Today, newer artists are trying to revive Hadrami music, like Muhammad al Bahum. Thank you! Okay, so after all of that, I think maybe now you're kind of getting an idea of what Yemen is, maybe on the surface at least. But what is Yemen to the outside world? Let's uh, observe that a little bit more in the next segment, shall we? Friend zone. Oh boy, here we go. This is gonna get interesting because with Yemen, diplomacy is surprisingly very complicated. Everything is kind of based off of whether you ask the north side or the south side. Before we get into all the conflict stuff though, let's start off with the outsiders that both sides can say they are relatively close to or can claim some kind of connection to. For one, East African nations, especially those close to the Red Sea like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Djibouti, and Somalia, have always had a long close connection to Yemen due to their incredibly intertwined history. Many people from these countries have migrated to each other in the past, intermarried, and have similar values often rooted in either Islam or general cultural undertones. It might be a stretch, but I was told maybe even Indonesia and Egypt are considered good friends, as Egypt was considered the honeymoon destination for Yemeni couples before conflict times, and Egypt is usually seen as a respected country, whereas Indonesia has a close connection as it was said that the spread of Islam can be contributed to the Hadrami sailors that came from Yemen centuries ago, and today there is even a small community of them living still in Indonesia. If we bring it closer to home, of course it depends on who you ask, whether it be the north or south side of Yemen. No surprise, the north Houthi slash Shia side of Yemen obviously has gotten at the very least sympathetic sentiments from other nations with Shia communities, most notably Iran and parts of Syria and Lebanon. Although Iran denies any involvement in any conflict related matters, you be the judge of the claim. In addition, North Korea announced in their state media in 2024 that they delivered weapons to the Houthis in Yemen via Iran, which in that regard kind of blew Iran's cover, but everyone already kind of knew anyway. For the south side of Yemen, obviously the GCC states, mostly led by Saudi Arabia, were the ones that supported them during the civil war and launched a rebellion against the Houthi side. Side note, this conflict is also the main reason why Yemen is the only country in the Gulf that is not a member of the GCC. But if we step back and take out all the drama, one country is loved by both sides. No shocker, it is Oman. I mean, everybody in the Arab world loves Oman anyway, but in this particular tense situation, they played their own game wisely. They were the only GCC country to step aside and refuse involvement in the Yemeni civil war, and Omani diplomats have worked their best to mediate relations between conflicting sides. Oman and Yemen share a close history as neighbors, and they share many cultural tropes too. They just get each other really well, and to this day, Oman is probably the only country both sides of the conflict can fully trust and love. Yay for Oman! In conclusion, if you just take away all of the modern complicated stuff from Yemen, not only will you notice that it really is the secret, hidden, untouchable gem of the Arab world, but it deserves to be rightfully so because this is kind of where it all started. There is no better way to end all of the Arab world than to take it all back to where it all started, Yemen. Stay tuned, our second to last country episode, Zambia, is coming up next.